Welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate, the podcast that asks you what you want to be when you grow up so you can graduate into retirement with purpose and passion. I'm your host and valedictorian, Eric Brotman, and this is the kickoff of season five. I cannot believe we've been doing this now for five years. It's also our first show that is video. So, you know, I, this is a brand new frontier for me, and I cannot think of a better guest to have on our first episode of season five and our first video than Joe Saul Cihai. And uh, Joe is the creator and co-host of the Stacking Benjamins podcast, an amazing podcast. He's the co-author of Stacked, this book, which is phenomenal, um, Stacked, Your Super Serious Guide to Modern Money Management, written by Emily Guy Birkin with Joe's assistance, I think. Um, no, I'm only kidding. He, he and Emily wrote it together, and it's fantastic. Joe, welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate. I, I love how you made yourself the valedictorian, by the way. That's always my favorite part. I'm the valedictorian. I was never, I was never close. I was Who's never the remotely master? close. Who's the <laughs> I, I don't even want to think about it. But yes, this is the first time I've ever been referred to as the valedictorian, and it's irrefutable, which I really love. Well, so, it is. It, it is. So so you're a repeat guest on our show, and, and I did have Emily on the show. We've talked about the book, and, and hopefully some of our, our viewers have, have picked it up and enjoyed it as much as I have. I know we'll get into that a little bit today, but what I really want to spend some time with you on today is talking about some of the best and worst financial advice you've ever seen, heard, or, or uh, encountered, and some of the best and worst financial advisors you've ever seen, heard, and encountered. And I'll pitch in on both of those because I certainly have uh, encountered both, but I just thought it would be fun to, to not only leave our, our audience with some great ideas, um, but also some, some red flags, and they're ample. So, so where would you like to begin? Man, do we, are you asking me if I want to start with advisors or with advice? Is that Absolutely. I'm, I'm okay either way. There's, this is a, it's an equal opportunity kind of thing. Well, let's start with advice because I personally, you know, uh, and your listeners may not, Eric, that I haven't been a financial planner in a long time. It's been maybe 14 years since I was a financial planner, but I still think that most people need people in their corner. Like we need to be thinking about the things that are important to us. Um, so I don't want to go after financial advisors right away for that reason, because I think that we all have blind spots and protecting those is super important. So let's go over after bad advice, because what's funny is, is that when I, when I made the transition from advisor to just more what I do now, financial media, what I found was I started spending a lot of time on social media. Of course, you know that over the last 14 years, that's gotten to be more and more and more time. And we've gone from, you know, doing just audio on our podcast to now video to doing all kinds of different channels. Like you, you, it's hard to make sure that you're finding your audience. And if you're trying to preach financial literacy like you and I are, you're increasingly finding yourself in all these other places. The problem I've seen, Eric, is that the worst financial advice is always on social media channels. And the reason for that, I think, is because most of the responsible people, and a lot of people don't know this. You and I know this, but a lot of, a lot of your, your listeners and viewers now don't know this, is that there's this thing called compliance. And compliance makes it so that really smart people don't accidentally say something dumb, right? That, that is hurtful, might hurt their, 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 their financial picture. So they have this system of checks and balances that makes sense. The, there's always, when things like this happen, where we have this well-intended thing called compliance, there's also some negative stuff that came out of that. And that is this vacuum still gets filled. There's now a vacuum of smart people who aren't talking uh, because they're afraid of their compliance monster coming down to them and going, no, you shouldn't say that. Or in some cases, you know, Eric, some people that are great people that work for big firms, the big firm, rather than spend a lot of money on compliance, just says, no, you can't talk. No, 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 you can't do anything on social media. You can't do much on social media. Or it also has to be these pre-programmed, ugly, you know, just very salesy messages. So this void gets filled by people that don't have any compliance. So generally, when you get advice on social media, the first thing you have to do, you have to do, and nobody does it because it's a pain and people don't even know to ask this question, is you have to look at not just what are the person's credentials, but 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 are they working through any filters? Do they have any compliance? Do they have any background? Do they have any? Are they a CFP? Are they a fiduciary? Are they all these different things before you actually listen to them? Some of those people are out there, but man, some of the advice 
that uh, I see all just crazy because the smart people can't counter them, I think, enough. You know, compliance, I'll, I'll give compliance a shout out because they, they really are looking out for, for all of us uh, as an industry. And of course, they're also dealing with um, regulatory impact and legislative things and things that, um, that do make it more difficult in a lot of cases to, um, to send a message out to the public. And there, there's plenty of advisors who really don't mess with it or who think this is a little too scary. I'm not going into those waters. But um, I would say having that filter has been good for, for me and for our firm because it has allowed us to hone our messaging to make sure that it is, um, that it's crisp and that it's uh, reasonable. And that's not always an easy thing to do. So I, 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 you're right, a lot of the advice on social media is, uh, is garbage. And by the way, that's not just financial advice. You can get advice about anything. I'm not sure you can trust the recipes you see on, on Pinterest either. So in fairness, there's right. lots of junk out there. Um, but but on the financial side, you could really do a lot of damage to yourself and to your family and to your business and, the, and so forth by taking uh, advice that is not only not sound and certainly not uh, prescriptive for you, but also might be not based on anything. Some of the worst ones that I've seen are people that just don't, it's, it's, it's well-intentioned, but they don't know what they're talking about. Like some, th these people bother me more than schemers. We can go into the schemers next because man, some of these people with these, these crazy things that they're pushing on uh, social media drive me crazy. But, but I'll tell you one that was big as an example, somebody uh, was talking on social media about, you know, if you think that the markets are volatile and right now you're finding that, that uh, savings accounts aren't paying any money, Eric. So you know what we do? you put your cash reserve in gold you put it in gold and you and i know that gold is so damn unpredictable it is eight times more volatility on a daily basis uh uh not over long terms over long terms gold is boring as i'll get out but on a daily basis it's mm -hmm. so damn volatile it's eight times more volatile than the stock market so when we when when you say don't put money in stocks because it's too volatile put it in gold like you're taking your money out of the stock market to put it in sometimes the eight, eight is eight times the casino in any given day. I don't want that. I, you know, stick with, stick with the savings account. So when I hear well-intentioned advice from people that just don't know what they're talking about, it kind of makes me sad. Well, and a lot of the people who uh, espouse that advice are in the gold business, strangely, um, where you, where you hear folks <laughs> which, who are, which are actually next one, the schemers. Well, it, but that may not even be a scheme. It might just be that that's what you do for a living. And so that's what you're espousing. But one size never fits yeah. all. I don't know about you, but I don't look great in a hospital gown. It's the only garment I've ever worn. I think that's one size fits all. And I'm not even sure it fits my whole. It fits my most. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> just keep the front. Just make sure that right. the open backside doesn't, <laughs> that's doesn't, that's doesn't correct. show off. Correct. See, show this a is a family show. I have, might I have already destroyed that. Yeah, the family show is already out the window. My bad. But but no, it, it, so when you talk about those situations and you talk about somebody who's, um, the, the schemers are one thing. I mean, I can't go six hours without getting some kind of phishing attack or attempt on my cell phone or this bank or that bank yeah. or click here. And yeah. it, it's especially pervasive for seniors. I mean, seniors are getting these messages and they look so authentic. And it's really a very scary thing. But beyond the the technical side of it, you just have people who are who who make a living stealing from people. It, it, it's it's a it's a it's horrible, and and it does happen. There's no question about it. And Bernie Madoff didn't do our industry any favors. And he was on, I believe, uh, he was on the list of, of of candidates for the board positions in the regulatory agencies. Sure. Well, I spoke, Eric, with uh, with uh, um, the woman, uh, uh, Diana Enriquez is her name, who wrote the the original book that the movie was based on. And I interviewed mm -hmm. her and she dove into just how trustworthy this guy was. Like in every other facet of his life, he was a community member. He talked very professionally. There was nothing schemy or scammy about him. It was a first class operation he ran. They had an amazing uh client experience right his uh his uh uh charts and graphs that he showed you heck the the fake uh, uh, uh the fake statements you got from bernie looked phenomenal 
all fake, all, uh, all fake. So, so that makes it difficult. Yeah. But when I was talking about schemers, I wasn't even talking about him. I was actually talking about who you were talking about early on, which is people that work in an industry, because if somebody's giving you advice about gold and they work in the gold industry and they don't disclose that, which happens far too often, there's all these, mm -hmm. you know, people complain about, um, uh, a lot of people, especially in our business, complain about commissions and paying commissions or paying advisors, right? Paying advisory fees. And yet they have a bunch of undisclosed links on their social media and on their website that are all commissions. <laughs> they're getting paid tons of commissions while they're complaining about our people and commissions, which I find very ironic. But, but I'll tell you, when I talk about schemes, I'm talking about using life insurance as a savings account which which can go well. I don't know how much you know about infinite banking. It can go well. The problem is it goes well, Eric, until it doesn't. And the bad news is, is that when crap happens and you can't use it in the prescribed way that makes this very complex strategy hum, it not mm -hmm. only unravels that, it unravels your entire life. Like it goes from good to bad in a hurry because you didn't just play the straightforward game. So that one bothers me. The people out there now with the markets all over the place, right? Uh, people selling fear with annuity sales. Annuities mm -hmm. aren't the devil, as you know. Annuities can be fine, can be great. But the mm -hmm. people selling fear along with their annuity and not disclosing that there's a commission at the end of this rainbow for me, mm -hmm. I think is pretty mm -hmm. disgusting. Well, and, and I do think that happens frequently. And, and I agree with you. The annuity as an example is a tool. It's not the right tool for every job. It's certainly not right for everybody. And there are reasons why um, some people should and some people should not utilize that. I think if you're in the annuity business and what you do is you call and sell annuities to people and that's what you do, that's problematic. But I think if it's part of an over, uh, you know, an overarching strategy, I don't know that that's problematic. Um, the life insurance thing, it's interesting you bring that up because I'm, a, I'm actually a very big fan of using life insurance as a uh, cash equivalent and as an asset um, and have used it personally to buy my first home and to start a company and have used it properly. Um, I do think there are a lot of folks out there who are selling life insurance for things it's not intended to do. Like I've seen folks out there saying, it's a great way to save for college. It's not. It's not a great way to save for college. Um, I, I've seen it misused many, many times by people who that's the only tool in their toolkit. So they try and use it for every job. Um, but I don't think as a strategy, and you're right, it is complicated to do it properly. But I think if you've done properly, it can be very, very helpful and, and very tax uh, efficient, but um, used well, improperly thing, once you under a disaster. Yeah, Eric, once you understand it, and that's the problem is everybody's using shortcuts. And I think that that um, uh, 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 cash value life insurance policies, you can't use shortcuts. You have to understand the mechanics of the process. And frankly, once you, once you know it, it's a little like riding a bike, right? I mean, then once mm -hmm. you know it, you know it. But so many people don't get the fact that if you stuff, and, and, and here's, here's the big for everybody, yeah. the mind blower, uh, which is if you stuff more money in it, it's cheaper. Like that right there sounds like, what the hell? Hand your life insurance company more money and it's cheaper? What the, no, no, that just goes again. But it's true. It is absolutely yeah, true. Well, the, the, the thing like everything else, when you, yeah, it does as long as, as long as you don't trip the IRS rules on modified endowment contracts and all the things where you, where you screw up all the tax. So you can go too far. So yeah. you, you, it's not like someplace where it's a panacea. You're the only, the only panacea I've come up with. And my compliance department, since we talked about them, our compliance department hates when I say it's the perfect vehicle, but by gosh, it's the perfect vehicle. So sorry about that compliance, um, is the HSA. The health savings account used properly is the single perfect vehicle I've ever seen. It's the only place where you can get a tax deduction for contributions, where you get tax deferred growth and can invest the money, uh, and where you can get tax-free withdrawals for things that are healthcare that, by the way, all of us are going to use at some point in our lives or our spouses. Um, it's truly a perfect tax planning tool that is grossly misunderstood and misused. I've had uh, Jean Chatsky from NBC was on uh, our show talking about this, and she said people just don't understand it. They're not using it properly, but used properly, it's it's as good as it gets. Super. It's absolutely super. And man, I hope we get rid of some of these this uh, ambiguity between the HSA and the FSA. I feel like as as we see wider adoption of the HSA, we'll see some of these things get get uh, cleaned up. That that sadly, I think make it 
adopted less. And I think everybody's on board, right? I mean, who's not on board with more adoption of the HSA? I think the insurance companies like it because it takes some of the onus off of them, right? Makes more high deductible plans out there, which I think that they like. Uh, I think the average person's saving once they understand it likes it. Like there's nothing not to like. And the fact that we've got some barriers between you and using it is uh, is sad. But man, I would, you know, I don't like predicting the future and I know you don't either. It's like deal with the reality the way it is, not the way you hope it will yeah. be. Is a is a great Jack Welch quote, uh, Jack Welch quote, easy for me to say that I really like, but, um, but I do think that's going to get cleaned up at some point. Well, the flexible spending accounts because of the use it or lose it nature of them, uh, people mess them up and you wind up with three pair of glasses at the end of the year that you didn't need because otherwise you were eating the money. And, and, you know, I, now it works great for dependent care for people who can use it for, for daycare. Um, and I'd actually love to see that expanded because a $5,000 limit toward daycare expenses is a joke. For anyone who's got kids in daycare, it's not five grand a year. It's a lot more than that. And finding a way to- It's a to, bajillion. To, oh my gosh. It, it, paying for kids makes you, makes you question whether it makes sense to have both of you even working at a job. Like at some point you have to think, I is have, it better to, to work, to, work for, to have both spouses work so that you can pay for daycare or to have one spouse not work just so you're not paying for daycare, it might be a wash. I have twins. And when my twins got done with daycare, went to school, I felt like I got the most massive raise. Like I got this <laughs> massive, yeah. massive raise. All of a sudden I'm like, why the hell is there money in my savings account? Like, what is this about? <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> well, your, your kids must be in public school then because private school is no panacea uh, either. Yeah. How old yeah. are your twins? Yeah, they did do... They did a public. Well, they're 27, so that was a long time ago. So hopefully okay. they've graduated by now. I'll have to go ask. So are you them. already they're saving for you saving saving for grandkids' education yet? Doing some legacy planning? I am not. You know, I don't know if I'm happy or sad that they have not had kids, and neither one seems interested at this point. So oh, wow. um, yeah, on one hand you're yeah. like, come on, kids, clock's ticking on grandpa, but on the other, ah, I'm like, you know, good for them to get it. their financial house in order first. So it, it it's true. The people who procreate young. Um, they always say it's great because we're empty nested when we're 48 and can do anything we want. But what they've missed is their 20s, which I don't know about you, but what I remember of my 20s was a great time. I was not married. I had no kids and it was a good time. I, that was, I'm on the opposite you know, end of that. Yeah. We, we, we had kids. We had kids fairly young. I was 27. When my kids were born. Okay. So, but, but, but like you said, you know, by the time I was 45, my kids were 18. Um, yeah. and, and it actually has made these later years, uh, a, a ton more fun. Well, I'm, I'm in my fifties and have a middle schooler, so uh, it, it's a totally different path. Um, you know, and I don't think there's one right or wrong way, but so let's shift no. gears and let's beat, let's beat on some bad advisors. Um, and let's also this send some, ad, let's send some attaboys to some good advisors too, because there's, there's some really good people. I, every industry. I don't care if it's law or medicine or engineering or education. Every industry has really great people in it and really lousy people in it. That's just the nature of humanity. It's the nature of a bell curve. It's the nature of life. In the financial business and in a lot of businesses, you, you hear about the bad ones. You know, we don't hear every day. There's no report that comes across your phone that talks about the plane that successfully landed at LaGuardia today. You only hear about the one that crashes. So in the financial world, it, it's very easy to, to, to think that everyone out there is out to get somebody because you're hearing that. You're hearing the really egregious, horrible Ponzi scheme type stuff. Um, but the fact is that like any other bell curve, if you look at the average financial advisor and then you realize that half of the people who call themselves financial advisors, and we can get into whether they are or not, but half of them are below average. That's alarming in any business. I wouldn't want a below average doctor, but let's talk about some of the below average advisors. Yeah, the, um, you know, I think we'll talk about great advisors just as the, as the opposite of this. Cause I wrote a piece a yeah. while ago for our old blog. It's no longer uh, up. I do have some of this in, in the book because it was so good which are just these ideas, these, these tips to find out if an advisor stinks before Eric, before you even meet with them. So if you go into an office, like people used to a lot, and, mm -hmm. and some people still do, you can get so many clues from the office. And here's why I'm an expert in this area. When I was doing public relations for American Express and then for Ameriprise, 
I, uh, my, my work took me into different offices. So I got to see how different uh, uh, people operate. And average person doesn't know how th- this organization, Ameriprise, works, but they are independent, by and large, independent, uh, uh, semi-captive uh, people that, um, that, that work inside of these offices. But, but a lot of them own their own business. So it's like a McDonald's franchise, I think mm-hmm. it might be an analogy mm-hmm. that they won't like, but we'll go with. So, uh, so I'd walk into all these different you know, into semi-independent businesses. And I'll tell you, if you walk into that lobby and they are playing Kramer or Fox business or the midday, you know, what's hot in stock world land. If, if you see wall street at all on a big screen, you're in the wrong office because a good financial. All right, good. We're good. We got that one, right? (laughs) I was waiting, waiting to say, oh, Joe, Joe, you haven't been to my office yet. Be very careful. <laughs> but no, no, I'm with you on that one. So far, so good. Knowing you, I know you're not going to trip over any of these, dude. You're not going to trip over any of these. Oh, well, I, I but, hope but, not. But, the uh, pressure's on. I'm sweating. <laughs> but the reason is a bad advisor, a, a, a bad advisor is somebody that leads with product and not process. And if somebody wants you to believe that they're a trader, that trading is important versus goal aspiration being the most important thing, you're in the wrong office. And this was always the case. It was some person that wanted to position themselves as, as an oracle, that they knew everything about investing, about stocks, about about whatever so they'd always put the investment channel on and by the way all the all the uh people i would see in their lobby waiting to meet with these advisors they had deer in the headlights eric they're like oh you know they're like oh what's the oracle gonna tell me when i do it because that tv makes them nervous but if they have like the travel if they have the travel channel on or some cooking show on or whatever it might be something aspirational that we do motivational video that's a great office to be in Another, another, let, let, another before, tip before about you the go lobby. on. Yeah. Before yep. you go on, can you imagine being at your surgeon's office and walking in and you sit down in the waiting room for your surgeon and what you see on the video is somebody having surgery? Can you even imagine <laughs> right. that for two seconds? You'd be ill and be like, oh my God, I got to get out of here. Um, what you want to see is HGTV or, uh, you know, something like it's a, or a food network. I, I, particularly yeah. enjoy the food yeah. network when I'm sitting and waiting at the doctor's office. So, all right. So go ahead. Number two, yeah. what we got? Well, you know what I like my, my doctors, um, I used to complain because, uh, this, this, they did not have a good experience, a good, a good, uh, patient experience until you mm-hmm. got to the doctor and there, they were awesome. And luckily my doctor became a friend of mine and I, and I talked to them and they've made some of these changes, which is kind of flattering that they, that they did that. Mm-hmm. But the doctors also in back and doesn't know like what's going on, but, That's but right. they were playing like these, they were playing these news channels. And what's funny is I walk in and I immediately think my doctor has some political beliefs, right? Which I either mm-hmm. espouse or I don't espouse. And by the way, even if you're an advisor and I know advisors, I know some advisors that were with clients. Uh, uh, and when I sold my business, I actually sold my business to a guy who's like this. So if you're watching, mm-hmm. yes, I'm talking about you. <laughs> he, 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 he would talk politics in his client meetings. I'm like, you have no idea what your client's politics are. You've no, and it doesn't matter what your politics are to manage your money. I mean, we're not trying to predict what's happening in Washington. We need to deal with the fallout, no matter where laws are today. Again, deal with what's already happened, not what we hope is happening. And he'd spend half the meeting bitching about politics. But so if we're showing, you know, MSNBC or Fox News to pick the goalposts, right, on either side, if we're showing mm-hmm. that in the lobby, that's horrible. But let me give you the next one. The next yeah, one please. is whenever I walked into an office or I called an office, Mm-hmm. And the receptionist sucks. The receptionist seems not happy to see you or seems bitter or seems just like they're not good at their job or they're not good at the customer service experience. I will tell you all that comes from the top. And this is mm-hmm. not a financial advisory office. It's even if there's six or seven advisors working in an office, it's not that big. And mm-hmm. so every single office I went into where the receptionist, and, and I guess I'll give a little nod to receptionists that are new and just don't know enough yet. But if the receptionist is experienced and sucks, that's because their boss sucks. I saw that every single time in offices mm-hmm. uh, where I knew the advisor sucked. Like I knew when I walked in, I already knew it. Her or his receptionist, Eric, was crappy, was just absent because they knew it too. They knew it too. Yeah. 
All right, you're, you're never invited to my office, just in case somebody's having a bad day. <laughs> you're never welcome here. In fact, I'm changing the locks. <laughs> All right. So what? So, so how about how about a good one? Because um, you know we, we have a client relations department that I'll put up against anybody's, and they are they are the first impressions, and it's not reception as much as it's true client relations concierge. Um, sure. And sure. Know, we have three three people who do that who were born to do this, and it's you, you know you find the right people and you empower them to build relationships, and I think our clients actually like them more than they like us, which is fine. Um, but, but you're right. That does make a difference. So what are some other things, you know, I, I, yeah. I, I will tell you that when we built our office, we built it, um, in such a way, or we designed it in such a way so that it didn't feel ultra corporate. There's no marble. It's not stark colors. It's not gold, everything. It's not, um, uh, there is no, there, there's no TV actually in, in our front. And the last thing we want is the Wall Street Journal sitting there because it does cause a certain reaction. Right. We wanted it to feel more like somebody's den, more like somebody. And if if you yes. if you come in, even even the conference tables, they're all rounded. You don't want to feel like you're on the opposite side from somebody. You want to feel like you're you're sitting down and just having a chat. In fact, the conference room in, in the conference table in my office is a dining room table. I bought a dining room table instead of a conference table because it feels like you're sitting down with, with people you want to just sit and, and chat with. And it, it's a different experience. Well, it's funny you say that because my next point, uh, and all of these are, are actually the inverse. If you walk in and the receptionist is great, in my experience, that's because the advisor is great. The advisor generally it doesn't just get it with their employees. They get it with their clients. They understand what people are looking for. The reception experience is good. Um, uh, and it doesn't have to be, by the way, over the top. I'm not talking about over the top. I got very distrustful. Somebody's offering me like eight different kinds of very expensive coffee served in this immaculate thing. I'm like, are you spending money? Are you, are you spending tons of money on, you know, this uh -huh. stuff that really doesn't matter? But don't get me wrong. I walked into one office and they had these, not even the full size. They had these little, uh, like three quarter size um, uh, uh, styrofoam cups where they're Ooh. serving the world's crappiest coffee. Like, th like that made the advisor look cheap. You don't want to look cheap, uh -huh. but on the other side, right. you want to look good. But yep. to your point, the next thing I was going to say, when you go to the advisor's office, if they are sitting in a high back chair behind a big old desk and Mr. or Mrs. Client or Miss Client is sitting in a very uncomfortable chair across the desk. They've got this beautiful thing that's very comfortable for them. You're uncomfortable. That is, I will tell you how many times I saw that was on purpose. The advisor has, uh, I don't know if it's a Napoleon complex or doesn't feel comfortable in their own <laughs> uh -huh. skin, but they, but they wanted you to feel a little uncomfortable and they wanted to be seen as the boss. I think a good advisor was exactly what you talked about. The best advisors had often a round table, like, you know, Arthur mm -hmm. in the, the round table where all the knights are equal, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we're learning from each other. And I like the advisor to kind of have really the heart of a teacher. If, if the advisor... Mm -hmm. If the advisor is trying to teach you that this stuff is easy enough for you to understand it and that you're going to be smarter when you walk out of that office than you were when you came. So if your advisor gets hit by a truck, you're actually a smarter consumer. That's a great advisor. If the advisor is hiding it behind a shield and is going, yeah, I'm not going to tell you anything until you pay me. That's a that's a that's an absolutely rotten, rotten advisor. So the heart of a teacher and we're all in the same chairs or we're in this very comfortable environment to meet is something that that I really like. And by the way, virtually, virtually it's still the same, right? If I'm on a if I'm on a Zoom call and somebody's leading with product and not process, I think I run. If somebody mm -hmm. isn't uh, inquisitive about my life, I think I run. And if the people that work for them are not inquisitive and it just feels like a factory, that's because it is. I mean, trust Eric, I think I think in a lot of this customer ex experience thing, you can really yeah. trust your gut because over time I found 99% of the time, my gut was right. There were a few advisors that had some rough exteriors that I found out were just some of the best people ever. But you mm -hmm. also saw that from the people around them. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, why does a guy who comes across like such a jerk have such great people around? It's because they're not a jerk. It's because they have resting, you know, whatever face or whatever uh -huh. it might be. And I find <laughs> out later they're really, really good people. But you can get lots of clues, I think. And, and learning to trust those clues is a great way to find great advisors. So, so I want to make sure we spend a little time talking about the book. 
because first of all, um, I, Stacked is a great book. It's worth reading. I, I read it on an airplane and it's bright yellow so that everyone on the airplane knew I was reading it, um, which I, I'm sure wasn't an accident. I'm sure you were like, what we want is something that glows in the dark so that no one can miss it on the shelf at the bookstore, which, I, you know, whatever works for you. Uh, but no, talk a little bit about it. We heard Emily's take on it. And, and she and I she and I beat on you pretty good, actually, in, in that episode. Good. So if you haven't good. heard it, I think you probably should. But this is a chance to get even. She is definitely going to see this. So here's here's a chance if you choose to take the the you know the low road, you could get even, or you could take the high road and say that she's the the brains behind it. Whichever way you want to go. Let's talk about the book. Well, I can't get even because you know her and you know me, and she is the brains behind it. Wow. And uh, and she was fantastic. The idea for the project was mine, uh, so I will take uh, I will take that. I will say that uh, a great lesson I learned in writing this book is uh, something a mentor taught me a few years ago, Eric. That if I had been younger when I learned this, it would have made me lots and lots and lots of money. Which is when you're in the weeds about something, ask who, not how. Don't ask how to do something. If you ask how to do something, you're going to end up on a bunch of YouTube videos. It's going to be uh, humble. You know, you're going to try to DIY something that you don't have any background in. Ask who knows how to do this. And can I either hire them, work with them, or can they teach me, right? They'll teach mm -hmm. me exactly what I need to know. And if it's somebody you know, they also know your learning style, so you're much more likely to know it. So I had written a book over 10 years that had been absolutely horrible. Um, it, it, it was not at all me. It wasn't fun. It wasn't funny. I'm not saying that I'm super fun and fun. I guess I am saying I'm super fun and funny when I, when I say it that way. But that I is think so. that's our whole stack. It's our whole Stacky Benjamin's world is to, yeah. you can do this. It, you can do this. You need smart people in your corner, but you still need to know it. And guess what? You can do this. And so um, I asked who, not how. And uh, Emily Guy Birkin, as you know, somebody that's written marvelous books about retirement, oh, yeah. about financial planning, about social security, about all the topics, about investing, all the topics. She's well-respected in the industry. And I said, hey, you want to do something that is incredibly, I think, competent. It's a very competent book, but it also is a mm -hmm. book with a sense of humor that I don't see a lot in, in this yep. business. So, um, so she, I was very excited that she, she jumped on board, but we talk about advisors, as you know, um, the book is organized like the Cub Scout Wolf Guide. So it starts off with, it's all achievements mm -hmm. and you start off with easy achievements at the beginning. If you're just laying the foundation or if you know your stuff, go to the back quarter of the book because that is all really the the, the kind of high end 201, 301 and graduate level uh, stuff to put it in Eric Brotman terms. Ah, well, thank you. Uh, I, I actually, when we spoke with Emily, she said, she said this was the first chance she had to write a book that was that allowed her to be funny. Because you, usually it's such a serious topic and it doesn't have to, like I, I wrote my book, I had one of, one of our employees this morning said, I really uh, enjoyed what you said about the Salem witch trials in your book. And I thought, well, <laughs> you know, uh, I hope you, you, you took it in the context I meant it, my gosh. Um, but, you know, I, right. I had likened, well, because, because the, the creator of, of retirement was the same human being who came up with that. Like no joke, if you if you do the research on retirement, the whole idea of retirement is brutal, and no one should do it. If you knew the real definition, no one would sign up for it. People sign up for financial independence, financial freedom, um, you know, a sense of purpose, a sense of all those. But no one would sign up to retreat and be and be literally put out to pasture and just to go wait to die somewhere, which is what that was. And so. Um, so, so it's nice that that it was relatable in that way. I mean, I, I know when I when I wrote "Don't Retire, Graduate," I wanted to to quote great philosophers, and one of them was uh, one of my favorite philosophers is uh, Chris Rock. And um, what Chris Rock <laughs> said was, he he said, "Wealth is relative." He said, "If Bill Gates woke up tomorrow with Oprah's net worth, he'd want to jump out a window." And I thought that was brilliant because the rest of us could probably do just fine on what Oprah's worth, right? But uh, so, so Stacked is a book people should pick up. And for those folks who don't know Stacking Benjamins and who won't get the reference that I have spent time in your basement, um, tell us a little bit about the show so we can get some, so, so get you some near, new earbuds because it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal show. It's funny. It's time sensitive. Um, it, you have a great way of making something both timely and timeless, which is hard to do. Um, and you guys do an awesome job of that because it, it allows 
for the news of the day to be put into perspective that's more than just tomorrow's wastebasket. And I, and I really like how you well, do that. Thanks, man. And we work very, very hard at it. Um, our production schedule is is uh, pretty intensive. But, you know, there's a – I think we need to make it playful on purpose. Like, I'm not being playful. And whenever I see the negative – any negative – and we don't get a lot of negative reviews. But when we do, it's always the same one. Stop messing around. Well, let me tell you why we mess around. Because I love statistics and I love the science of play. Studies show that it takes you about 4,000 repetitions of something to make it a habit. But if you turn it into play, it takes between 40 and 80 repetitions. Just think about the difference in those numbers. Mm -hmm. If we just make it a little more playful and we stop this, these, these, you know, wind conditions that are horrible. And we do it even more with money, as you know, Eric, we get oh, yeah. all, we get all, uh, you know, the temperature is so high. We need to lower the temperature. We need to relax. We need to make it fun and relatable and realize this is a marathon, not a sprint. And man, if I can do just one or two good things uh, every day, pick up one or two new skills a day, like that will help me a ton. So Stacking Benjamins is born of that. It's in my mom's basement because of the fact that when we started this almost 11 years ago, everybody was in mom's basement that made a podcast and we, we were going to own it. But also we're two guys that know what they're talking about. And we we wanted to make sure that people didn't get obsessed with the fact, oh, I don't want to listen to a couple of, you know, longtime money nerds. Let's forget about that. We're two dudes in mom's basement chatting about money where people, smart people like Eric come down and, um, and we have a good time just chatting in a very light way about some, frankly, pretty serious stuff, you know? And so uh, if we, so that is our teaching style. If we can lighten it up and make it lots of fun, you I think you're much more likely to, uh, to, to get some financial literacy in your life, which I think we're all after. We're definitely all after it. So I, I got to ask you before we, before we uh, call it a day today, uh, and I could talk to you all day, um, what do you want to be when you grow up? I've asked you this before, and I was dissatisfied with your answer, so I'm going to keep prying. Because <laughs> <laughs> you failed the first test, so this is a retest. What's next? What do you want to be when you grow up? And I, I don't. Well, and I know, and I know what I. Who do you want to be when you grow up? You know. <laughs> I know what I told you last time, and I told you last time that that I'm very lucky that I I actually have a quote second career, right? So I yeah. am doing what I wanted to do, and if I'm doing this when I'm 90, I'm happy. But you know something? So I'm going to give you a real answer, which which I, I really want to be a race car driver. Like I would freaking love oh. to be my favorite, my favorite thing to do because I don't drive fast cars. My wife has a heart attack every time I talk about it. So I play, um, mm -hmm. fans of our show know that I, I like playing Xbox. I don't have nearly the time to play Xbox that I hope I do. When I do, I play golf or racing games generally. Uh -huh. And man, I, I just love racing. Racing is so fun. Um, I like every type of racing. Formula One, man, that Formula One series on Netflix is so good. Um, watching NASCAR on TV is a little boring, um, but watching NASCAR live is fantastic fun. So um, I, yeah, racing. I, I'll be a race so car driver. Driven, How about that? Have you, have you driven a stock car before? I haven't even done the, uh, yeah, right, where so, you go so out you, to the track and they for? do the thing. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, do it. I've done it twice. I know my wife will have a heart attack. I've I drive. Well, she doesn't have to be I in the drive car. A ton. I drive a ton on my Xbox, and I love it. And by the way, I always uh, use. You know, you can change the view. No, you can change oh, the view sure. on your video game. I always sure. change it so I'm in the driver's seat. I don't do that crap where you're behind it. And and I have and I should have had it out out here because I knew you're gonna ask me this question. Uh -huh. I bought the world's most expensive steering wheel, uh, <laughs> where you sit and you've got steering wheel and pedals. So Tell me you dude, don't have the chair. I am. You have the chair? I, you have a gaming no, chair? No, no, I don't have the chair. I want okay. one. I would Why love to have go one. To a but, real go to a real track. Go drive. A, I, your wife does not have to be in the car with you. I've driven and all these great be. places. No. I'm, not, right. Right. I'm, not, I'm not unhappy, but you're right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's an awesome answer, and I like it better than you're already doing what you wanted to be when you grew up. Because uh, as I tell my, my 12-year-old, adulting's a trap and no one should do it. Um, so just because we get older doesn't mean we have to grow up for sure. So I love that. And I'm for, for the record, I'm an Xbox or two and not nearly as much I, as I'd love to be, but I, I'm a gamer. Too. I, it's, it's, I think it's a generational thing. You know, I think it's reasonable yeah. for our parents to still look at us and go, you're in your fifties. What are you doing, man? But the fact is it's, 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 it's fun. 
It's such a great release, man. At the end of a at the end of a tough day, if I just sit down, I tell my wife sometimes, I'm like, hey, I just want to go back in the back room and have a controller in my hand and just be around nobody. Like that is that wow. is heaven for me. It's fantastic. We, we, yes. I think yeah, we yeah. have just taken money nerd to a new level and just been nerds. Both of us. We've just Amen. we've just uh, our our inner nerddom is definitely out and I and I love it. Joe, where can people learn more about you, hear your your amazing podcast, get a copy of your book and all that good stuff? Wherever you're listening here, you'll hear the Stacky Benjamin Show, the greatest money show on earth. We call it that because it's a circus, as you know, Eric. And uh, mm -hmm. you know what? With the book, support your local bookstore. Um, I love local bookstores. If you're going to listen to it, listening to it's fun because we actually include experts. You mentioned Jean Chatsky. She's one of the subject matter experts in the book. At the end of every chapter, we have snippets from the Stacky Benjamin Show that are interviews with these people that kind of you know, uh, nail down a chapter so that you can, so you'll hear it. And plus you get to hear my mom, uh, ranting a little bit on the audio book, which is also fun. Do you ever clamor for meatloaf? Just, do you ever say mom meatloaf? <laughs> meatloaf. Does that ever happen? Meatloaf. We, All right. We, we play that clip at the beginning of some of our shows. <laughs> meatloaf. Joe, thanks. Thanks for being on. Thanks for being the kickoff, the first guest ever on video. I've been told over many, many years that I have a face for radio, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, but it, it's great to be on video. It's great to have um, uh, to have the Don't Retire Graduate season underway. You were a great first guest. I knew you would be. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for listening and many of you for watching for the first time. We'd love to hear from you. So please send us a message, leave us comments. Uh, Go to don'tretiregraduate.com, go to brotmanmedia.com, leave ratings and reviews. They mean everything to us. Uh, and if you enjoyed the show, don't keep it a secret. Share it with your family and friends. We will be back next week with another installment of Office Hours and in two weeks with another engaging guest, hopefully another Xboxer. Uh, for now, this is, yes, your valedictorian, Eric Brotman, reminding you, don't retire, graduate. Securities offered through Kestra Investment Services, LLC. Kestra IS, member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Kestra Advisory Services, LLC. Kestra AS, an affiliate of Kestra IS. Kestra IS or Kestra AS are not affiliated with Brotman Financial or any other entity discussed.